My name is Larry Stegall. Welcome to Managing Your Cellular Plan with Champ. Today's agenda, we're going to cover a few items. First, we're going to talk about the benefits of cellular iPads in both education and business. We're going to talk about how Jamf can assist in activating these resources. We're also going to talk about how Jamf can assist organization-based data usage goals. And maybe just one more thing. So what are the three Ds in education and what do they mean? Well, first one we're going to talk about is something called the digital divide. How did we address this issue? Well, in this space, education provided access to resources. We saw the growth of computer labs, iPads in the classroom, and one-to-one -one device initiatives. We need to just get resources in the hands of our kids. And why? Because they're digital natives. How do we provide rigor in learning environments and how do we empower these users? Today's technology has become as vital a resource in everyday life. iPhones and iPads are the norm rather than the exception. We even see developers writing applications in as early as elementary school. How can we best leverage these resources to make our users more productive? How can we leverage cloud-based systems to challenge our users to reach even higher levels? And something that's fairly new, something called the digital desert. What is this issue? Well, Connected Nation in 2019 referred to areas where families, businesses, libraries, schools, and entire communities that didn't have access to high-speed broadband as a digital desert. A study entitled, A Look at Broadband Access, Providers, and Technology, examined and analyzed broadband coverage and data released by the Federal Communications Commission. What researchers from Purdue University and Oklahoma University found was a little bit concerning. Norman, Oklahoma's largest ward incorporated about half the city's geography, but when it came to the internet and cell phone coverage, it was like a world apart from the rest of the city. I can sum it up in one word, poor, poor to awful. I can't even get my cell phone to work inside my house half the time, one resident stated. Crossing 48th Street was like falling off a cliff, digitally speaking, where internet speeds would plummet. One resident shared, you can't do anything. I mean, YouTube's Videos buffer? Shoot, it's pretty dang ridiculous. So for our purposes, we will refer to digital deserts as locations without access, or even in some cases, no Wi-Fi or extremely poor speed. Because in a remote learning world, we have to be aware of these areas and plan on how to address them. So what did some schools do? Well, they looked at things like hotspots. It was a quick and easy resource basically an appliance that allows a cellular connection to turn into a Wi-Fi connection. Easy to hand out, easy to configure, easy to, easy to distribute. The problem with hotspots more than anything else is management can be difficult. And what I mean by that is if you have multiple users connected to a single hotspot, you can't configure individual users. You can't say only use cellular data with this user, but not that user. It's just a simple Wi-Fi connection. And again, that ever popular multiple users on a single device, they're sharing that connection. Speeds can decrease. And frankly, it's just another device, something else to become damaged, lost, not operational. So what did we see? We saw the rise of cellular data resources, especially cellular data iPads. And to understand how they function, we have to know something about an element called a SIM. And what is a SIM? Well, it's commonly called a subscriber identity module, and it identifies the subscriber or the user to a network. And basically, there are two types of SIMs. One is called a PSIM or a physical SIM. And those are those little plastic cards that you slide inside your cell phones when you first get them and it connects it to the cellular data network. Easy, simple, plug it in and go. But how do we sit there and do large scales of devices? Do we really want to rely on a physical element? Then we begin to see the growth of something called the eSIM or the embedded SIM. 
Most of the time, it's a chip on the device which is configurable based on the needs of a user. eSIMs are usually not carrier specific. The major advantage to remember about eSIMs is that they can be programmed and do not need to be physically replaced when updated. If a change occurs, you don't have to take out a SIM and put a new SIM in. You just reprogram them. Now, to illustrate what I mean about how valuable eSIMs are, let's take a moment and let's think about how hotel keys have changed over my life period. When I was a kid growing up and you went to a hotel, the reception would give you a physical key. You would go to the room, insert the key, and unlock it. That's what gave you access, this physical key. But there were limitations to these physical keys. For example, what happened if you lost a key? Then all of a sudden, the hotel would either have to charge you for a replacement key, they'd have to contact a locksmith to come out and change the locks. It was a difficult process. And during that time, that resource, that room, was not operational because of a security risk. What did hotels do? They came out with something that was a configurable key, a little plastic card with a magnetic strip that we could actually swipe on the room and it would unlock it. And those keys could be programmed and changed as necessary. And in fact, even today, hotel room keys have advanced so far that we no longer even have to have plastic keys. We use an app on our phone and program it that way. Think of the eSIM as the same thing. We no longer have to have those physical limitations. If needed to be changed, an eSIM is just reprogrammed. Now, the key to the eSIM is something that's called the ICCID. Basically, the ICCID is an integrated circuit card identifier. It's a globally unique classifier used to identify hardware. It can be anywhere from 19 to 20 characters long, and it's stored digitally. It can also be physically engraved on a PSIM. Again, both PSIMs and eSIMs have these. If we're engraving them on a PSIM, how do we get them on an eSIM? Well, basically, we have to configure it. And we need some very important information. When you purchase a brand new cellular iPad, on the label, they will include two very important pieces of information, something that's called the IMEI and something that's called the EID. Well, the IMEI is a 15-digit number, and it's called the International Mobile Equipment Identifier. It is a unique identifier to that device. The second number is called the Embedded Identity Document. Both of these numbers may be required by your carrier so they can create or provision an eSIM for you. So let's look at an iPad before we actually activate it. Notice I've gone into the settings application on the resource, entered into the general application or general component, and went to about. And over on the right side, I see that the carrier identified as iPad. That means this device has never had an eSIM. By default, a cellular data iPad will identify its carrier as iPad. For iPhones, it will identify itself as an iPhone. But once we actually have an active eSIM, all that information changes. The carrier actually becomes our cellular data provider. In this case, it's the cellular data company. We'll also see our cellular data number. Think of that almost like a phone number. Your cellular data company will track it kind of like an account. The other important thing is also here, we'll see that ICCID. Think of that as the key to letting you on the cellular data network. So let's look through what could actually happen on how we could activate this and how Jamf can play a critical role in getting those iPads out in the field as quickly as possible. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our organization and we're going to sit there and we're going to make a determination to buy our cellular data iPads. We can either do this directly from Apple or an authorized reseller. 
we contact them and we purchase that resource. Now, if we are a large scale customer or purchase large numbers of these units, we can also ask the account team to provide us that IMEI and EID inventory. Now that's gonna become very important in a short period of time. Once we make those purchase order requirements, Apple is gonna go ahead and they're going to submit our serial numbers to either Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager, depending on our organization. Here's where our cellular data carrier comes into play. We have that inventory of IMEI and EID numbers. We're gonna contact our carrier and say, we need any eSIM profiles for these devices. And we're gonna submit that list to them. Now, this is where you have to work with your carrier and stage this appropriately. Some carriers will actually start charging you for your cellular service when it is an eSIM profile has been provisioned. So you want to make sure that they're provisioning those profiles as close to deployment as possible. That way you're not paying for a resource you can't use. Once they have your eSIMs ready for distribution or installation, they'll notify you. Now we can basically make sure we've met that requirement. They've notified us. Now we're ready for deployment. The devices get delivered to us and it's time to activate the resource. We take the iPad out of the box and we make a network connection. Now Jamf is going to play a very important role. We've already set up our automated device enrollment with either Apple School Manager or Apple Business Manager. Apple's activation servers are now contacted by the iPad. This can be done either through a Wi-Fi connection or tethering to a Mac device. Once the activation servers identify the devices, they're going to look for a device assignment. They're going to query either Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager and see if there is an automated device enrollment setting for this resource. In our case, there is. So the devices now get handed off to our Jamf resources. Now Jamf enters the picture. Jamf can start sitting there and enrolling the device and sending it MDM commands, including configuration profiles. We can get inventory about this device. We can start distributing applications. But since we can start sending it MDM commands, we can send a special command. And that special command is refresh cellular data a refresh cellular plan command. And we can send that from our device management system. Once that command hits the resource, the device will now contact a special server provided by the cellular data carrier. And that's where those eSIM profiles reside. The eSIM profile is then returned to the device it's activating the cellular data network on the resource. Once that occurs, now the device can connect to my cellular data carrier, a carrier, which means it can travel on the internet. And then the last part of this phase is I'm gonna get an inventory from the device. And in that inventory, I'm gonna find out the ICC ID, the cellular data carrier, I'm going to find out the carrier network number, the cellular data number. All of that important information will be submitted to my Jamf management server, whether it's Jamf Pro or Jamf School. And remember that command I told you, that refresh cellular plan command? What does it do? Well, simply put, it first of all does not sign your device up for a plan with your carrier. That has to be done ahead of time. The command simply tells your device to contact a specific server and download the profile. If there's no profile, the command will not execute. That special server is called an SMDP plus server, a subscription manager data preparation server. And that's a special resource from your carrier. And they use that to securely encrypt over the air installation within the eSIM.
basically this resource secretly packages the profile to be provisioned by something called the EU ICC. Some people think of the eSIM and the EU ICC as the same thing, and they'll use those terms interchangeably. Uh, the difference is the eSIM is the hardware component, EU ICC is the software resources that allow remote provisioning uh, of multiple network profiles. Now, we have our resource, everything is great. I have an eSIM on my device. We have to have a special consideration, and that is if there is any reason why we need to erase this device. Because if we erase the device, we have to be aware of the fact we want to make sure we do not erase the data plan. The reason behind it is when the SMDP server gives that eSIM profile to your device, it actually deletes it. It's a one-time shot. That's part of the security protocol from your carrier, which means if you wipe the device and you wipe the data plan, you're going to have to contact the carrier and have them provision a new eSIM profile. And that takes time and some carriers may charge for it. So if you did an on-device erasure, just make sure that you use the choice of erase all, but keep that data plan. That's critical. Again, I always tell everybody, organizations spend millions of dollars with user experience developers. Read the screen. They give you all the information you need to be successful. Now, if you choose to use your Jamf Pro console to erase a device, when you send that erase command, we do have a pop-up that says, retain the cellular data plan. And by default, we leave that checked for you. Um, we want to make sure that it's there that you're not going to erase it because if you do, it does require contacting the carrier to get a new eSIM profile provisioned. This can be done for a single resource or multiple resources. JAMP School, again, we have that same protocol. Just make sure you read and make sure that JAMP School's uh, terminology may be different. Uh, in some cases, retain, preserve. Just make sure that you're reading the screen because UX developers may change the terminology, but the implications always remain the same. Again, mass actions can be done for a single device. Now, what kind of scale does cellular data activation occur when you're using either Jamf Pro or Jamf School? We've seen organizations do it with thousands of devices. Again, as you work in a scale like this, make sure you start small. Make sure you're getting it building up you're working through your process, you're ensuring everything is flowing smoothly, and both you and your cellular network can ensure everything is operating properly. There is a feature that was provided uh, in James School about a year ago, and that has to do with the automated device enrollment profile within James School. The Jamf School development team realized that cellular data plans were becoming extremely important, especially over in countries in Europe. So they actually made a setting within the enrollment system that said, if you want, you can actually put that SMDP server in there and you don't even have to send those remote commands. It will automatically do it for you. The process is simple as selecting the checkbox configure eSIM and then providing that unique URL that your supported carrier has provided. Again, every carrier has a unique URL. Contact them to get that information. Now, how do we deal with cellular data limits? And what I mean by that is, how do we make sure when people have a cellular data iPad, they're using it based on the goals of the organization? If I was a school, I would want to make sure my students were using the cellular data iPad for their schoolwork and not necessarily watching YouTube videos. And if I was a business, I would want to make sure that my team was doing business operations and not watching Netflix. How can we do that? Well, quite simply, both Jamf Pro and Jamf School support configuration profiles that let us set network usage rules. We can actually set some custom ones. So for example, here, this is a Jamf Pro screen. We can determine which applications are allowed to use cellular data. And because there may be additional costs involved, roaming cellular data. So it's as simple as making a determination. 
And again, think about this. You can scope these configuration profiles to a single device or a group of devices, and those profiles can change based on needs. If your organization has a period of time, especially if you were a school and you said, kids are working on a YouTube project, and I know a number of my kids have to rely on their cellular data plan for being able to work at home, you might allow YouTube to be utilized over cellular network. But when the project is over, you simply remove that setting and the kids can only use YouTube if you allow them to use YouTube when they're connected to Wi-Fi. And again, we have the same capabilities within Jamf School, just looks a little bit different. The next thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is switching carriers, because has that ever occurred? Why would anybody ever want to switch a carrier? Well, let's talk about the economics about it. You've been with a carrier for a year. There may be a rate hike. Another carrier may come in and offer you a more lucrative approach, or you may actually have areas within your service that cellular data coverage may be different based on a carrier. Case in point, in my home office, on exactly the same cellular data iPad, I can access a network speed check from one carrier and I get a download of about 100 megabytes per second. I switch over to a different carrier, that exact same device, the exact same location, that speed drops to 5 megabytes per second. So it's a huge differentiation, and we need to make sure that we address that. So that could be a possible reason why. There could be an economics. It could be the carrier offers you a more advantageous thing as it relates to data usage. Uh, be very careful when you hear we offer unlimited data usage because sometimes carriers may implement something called throttling, where when you hit a certain level of your data usage, they may intentionally slow down your speeds. So again, there are a variety of reasons why to change it. So how do you do it? Well, it's really funny. It's almost exactly the same process as the initial provisioning. And we'll go over a little bit of that for you. And then finally, what's going to be the impact on that end user? How are they going to see this? Are they going to lose connectivity? Are they still going to be able to be productive? Well, switching carriers, Again, what you'll need to do is the exact same process when you activate it. You're going to communicate with the carrier. You're going to sit there and provide them the information necessary for them to provision an eSIM profile. And then you're going to utilize Jamf to send that remote command to refresh the cellular data plan. And then the device is automatically going to switch to the new service. So let's look at that from a workflow. Again, this is a device that's already on a cellular data network. We've already contacted the carrier. We've already got the profile provisioned. Now we just simply send that MDM command to our iPad. And now the iPad is going to contact the carrier and request the new eSIM profile. That SMDP is going to now deliver that profile to the iPad, once it's delivered, that profile will be deleted from the SMDP server. And then the cellular data iPad can now travel the carrier's network, which means they can get on the internet. And again, the device will submit its inventory. This can be done by creating an inventory group in Jamf Pro and just simply pushing the commands. Same as you could create a smart group in Jamf School doing the same thing. So switching carriers, how is a user impacted? Well, first and foremost, hopefully they'll see improved service. And as an organization, you'll see better data usage and maybe even a lower bill. Occasionally on cellular data iPads, we'll see some common notifications, one of them being carrier settings being updated. That's usually when your carrier makes configuration modifications and Apple provides them to you. Sometimes you may see something called cellular plan is ready to be installed. It's usually when it's that initial onboarding of the device. If you're using Jamf Pro or Jamf School to do that provisioning for you, just simply skip that step. The last one, unable to complete cellular plan change, 
Usually when you see this, you sent that MDM command to the device and an eSIM profile is not on the SMDP server. If you see this and you did send that command, contact your carrier and make sure that they do have a provision profile for you on that SMDP Plus server. There are some very exciting things that possibly can be coming in the future. One of which that I'm fascinated about is private LTE networks. And one of the places that things are going on that are really exciting is the state of Utah. The Utah Education Network is actually working with schools to set up their own private cellular networks. Basically, that means they won't have to contact a carrier to use cellular data iPads for their students. In essence, they'll be their own carrier. So if this is something that might be fascinating to you, you might want to give a look and see what's going on in Utah. Who knows, it might be coming to your organization. One more thing that I also think is kind of funny is iPhones. You ever thought about iPhones having two different cellular lines? It is available. Beginning with the iPhone XS and the XR, Apple provided you to have the ability to have two separate lines. And in fact, if you want, you can even use two different carriers as long as your phone is unlocked. If you're interested about this information, here's the support article from Apple. It's HT209044. Why would you want to have that capability? That way you don't have to carry around two phones, one for business and one for personal. So in this case, I can actually pick up the dial pad, select which business line I want to use, dial, and it's going to go from that line. But what's even more fascinating is if I have contacts in my phone, I can actually assign which cellular data line to use for texting and for phone service. Makes it a lot easier. And on top of that, if I have two different carriers, I can actually get the benefit of using the better uh, performance depending on which carrier and the location. Again, remember, all carriers are not created equal. Finally, I do want to provide you some additional resources that you can find on our JAMP website. Uh, we actually provide uh, documentation on the eSIM iPad setup with both JAMP School and JAMP Pro. If you need additional information, just simply contact your account team here at JAMP. We'll be glad to provide that for you. So let's recap what we talked about. We talked about how we've seen the growth of cellular data iPads in both business and education. I primarily focused on education because that's the organizations I work with, but the business applications of cellular data resources are off the charts. We talked about how easy and how uh, simple it is to utilize JAMP resources to provision eSIM profiles on devices, and in some cases, even how to switch carriers. We gave you some resources on how to make sure that your cellular data service is being utilized by the organization's goals basically making a determination whether or not you can utilize the cellular service by application. And if you need to, making changes. And we even kind of gave you a glimpse into something going on, some exciting things going on in Utah, that private LTE network initiative. I really want to keep my eyes on that because I think that's something that's going to become more and more prevalent within organizations. It's been a privilege to visit with you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your JNUC and I look forward to seeing you next year. Thanks.